Good evening and welcome to another uh, Northshire Live virtual event. My name is Damit Lund. I'm the events manager at Northshire's Manchester, Vermont location. And I'm here as almost always with my dear friend and colleague, Rachel Person, the events manager from our Saratoga Springs store. Um, before we get things started real quick, we are recording this for YouTube. It'll show up there on our YouTube channel um, before long, but don't worry. Only those of us who are unmuted and uh, in this nice little yellow box will be in, on YouTube in perpetuity. So if you have, when you have questions for our authors, please type them in the chat and uh, Rachel and I will save them up for the Q&A and post them then at the end. And then the last thing before I hand things over to Rachel to get started, uh, is just a note of thanks. It's been a hard year and uh, 15 months or so for uh, independent bookstores and independent businesses of all kinds. and. We couldn't be here without you, um, without your help and your support. And so we really appreciate it. Um, so thanks so much. And, and Rachel, please take things away. I am so very happy to get to welcome Helene Wecker to Northshire Live to talk about her new novel, The Hidden Palace, a follow-up to her book, The Golem and the Genie. Her writing is a gorgeous genre-defying blend of fantasy, literary fiction, and historic fiction with a dash of romance thrown in. I'm so thrilled to get to hear about this new novel tonight. And I'm delighted that she'll be interviewed by another Northshire staff favorite, Naomi Kritzer, the multiple award-winning author of the fantastic Chaos on Catnet series. Please join me in welcoming them both to Northshire Live. All right. Um, so, Helene, I wanted to start by telling everybody that I know you from college um, and that we lived together in Science Fiction Interest House in college because there's nothing quite so cool and incredibly nerdy as the fact that we are both science fiction writers and we lived together in a science fiction interest house and yeah. played in a D&D group together. And we, yes, every Saturday for, what was it, like four hours? Yeah. We would least... sit up in, in the, the student union with the, the grilled cheese sandwiches and, and roll dice. The student union was great too for, it was a perfect location for gaming because we had both tables where we could spread out like our, our miniatures and a whiteboard that we could use for like <laughs> and stuff. And I, sometimes we didn't erase it and I kind of wonder like because that those rooms were used for classes. I wonder what like the next person who used the room thought of them. <laughs> like, the, where where the, the gelatinous cubes are marked out and yes. <laughs> don't open this door or like you know when we would divide treasure by making a list and like crossing yep. stuff off and... <laughs> with all our character names on it. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I wanted to I wanted to start um, in talking about the Hidden Palace by by asking you about the way you wove together the narrative and the novel and the real world events that were happening at the same time, um, because uh, it takes place over about fifteen years, and there are a lot of real world. There's a lot of stuff happening in the real world during you know the period of nineteen hundred to nineteen fifteen. Um, and there's like, there's like a bunch of stuff in here that I looked up and I was like, oh, that really happened, like the archaeological dig um, and uh, like World War I. I mean, I knew that World War I was real, but um, <laughs> how did you decide what to include and what not to include? Um, were there any real world events you really wanted to work in that just didn't fit? Yeah, oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I should like back up and, and say that the way that the hidden palace starts is pretty much where the golem and the genie leaves off there's actually like a little bit of overlap between the two books um where at the the end of uh the golem and the genie um the they've they've made it through uh hava the golem and ahmad the genie have, have made it through the trials of the book and now they are um sort of coming back together and and uh there there's like a hint that they're going to start a relationship an actual relationship um and i'd had it in my mind that the hidden palace was going to start about seven years on um that it would open up um with sort of in media rest like with some calamity something happening that they would have to react to and then in sort of alternating chapters would be flashbacks uh, to the stuff that had happened in between the book to sort of show you where we, how he, we had gotten here. Um, the problem was that the flashback chapter started to take over um, and then there started to be flashbacks inside the flashbacks. So it became like flashback inception 
and I couldn't figure out where I was anymore. And at that point it was like, okay, this, this isn't working. So I'm going to have to really just back. And I sort of like kept working it backward and backward and backward. And then realized at some point, oh, wait, I'm just going to have to show everything from like the beginning, from the, the, the end of the first book. And at that point I realized that I had 15 years that I was working with from 1900 to 1915 because I knew I wanted the the book where I I knew that I wanted it to end in 1915 I thought at one point it was going to go to 1916 but then it didn't um and I was like okay my god if I'm telling like those 15 years those are 15 pretty momentous years in American life um especially in New York um so what am I going to show and I had to sort of pick by what was going to tie in most to the themes of the book with how it ended up without tossing everything in. I, I didn't want it to be like Forrest Gump. I didn't want it to be like, you're just seeing that they're there for everything. They, they, they managed to be there for every historical event. Um, but at the same time, it's sort of, if you're writing a book that's takes place, you know, at least partially on the Lower East Side, and, and you're writing about the year 1911, if you don't have the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in there, that's a pretty egregious thing to leave out. Um, so that sort of ended up dictating what I was going to show. It's like, okay, here's the time span. Here is how this book is going to, this is like the arc of the book, which events fit along that line and which just are going to yank the plot of the book or the themes of the book or the momentum of the book out of, um, uh, you know, whack, I guess. One that I really, that I wanted to include and it feels weird that I didn't still to me, I got a blank on the name of the ship it was like 1902 or 1903. There was a uh, like a, a sightseeing steamship that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. Anyone can jump in the, the chat and say it uh, if, if, if you know what I'm talking about. That was like um, it was German. The, the, it was one of the churches in Germantown and the Germantown neighborhood was having like a, a fun excursion to, I think like Governor's Island or something. And the, and, and the boiler exploded and the entire ship went down and like 2000 New Yorkers died on this thing. And it basically eliminated what was left of Germantown. Um, and it was like more than half women and children, I think, cause it was, you know, like a fun thing. And that it was like this general Slocum. Thank you for, thank you, Rachel. Um, <laughs> the general Slocum disaster in 1904. And it was just this horrific thing that a lot of somehow like got lost to history and people don't like know that it happened. Um, I don't think I ever learned about it in school. Um, and I, I was like, that would have been such a, you know, horrific thing for, you know, especially for Hava because of the way that she's built and that she, you know, just reacts strongly to, to you know, other people's pain and stuff. Um, and I just couldn't fit it in. I couldn't make it work because there were already too many tragedies in the book. And that would have been sort of like setting off all the gunpowder at the beginning as opposed to, you know, like where it needed to be. So that was the one that, that didn't make it in. I was really struck. So I, the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire was, was something that I remember thinking about when I read The Golem and the Genie. Uh -huh. I like looked up when it was happening and I looked up when the fire happened and I was like, oh, okay, you know, that's, that's not going to appear in this book because it's too far out. But then with the Hidden Palace, once it was clear that like, you know, time was passing pretty rapidly, I was like, oh, we're going to have this, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Like, that's so, <laughs> that was so, that is so central to like Jewish American memory of the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was, I was struck by the fact that like we see Chava encounter a fire, but it's a different fire. Mm -hmm. She's completely outside the Lower East Side when the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire takes place. Mm -hmm. So I actually wrote a version where she's at the fire. She doesn't actually go up into it, but she's like watching it. 
And the problem was then it became about the spectacle. It became about watching this horrible thing happen. And it's really hard to describe mass tragedy well in a way that either doesn't come off as absolutely like turgid and you're reveling in in the you know the the horribleness of it or completely banal um and so when i wrote a fire it was this like just an ordinary apartment building burning down that happens um earlier in the book and when it became about um when, when, when I got to the, the Sherwood West fire and I had tried and it just, it didn't work. There was a, a reader, like an early reader who was reading it, who was like, yeah, this is just not, it's too much. It's just too much that everyone's standing and staring up at this thing and women are dying. And I'm like, yeah, this is just, so I ended up making it so that you know what's happening while something else very personal is happening to someone else in, so, someone else is, is in danger, but in a completely different way while all of this stuff, other stuff is going on. And then we see the aftermath and those, those two things are sort of tied together. So it becomes almost like um, the character who is, who is in focus is almost like a proxy for everything else that is going on sort of off screen. Um, and that was my way of sort of getting around the whole, um, uh, yeah, just sort of like ugly spectacle of it. Um, I found it really effective to sort of have know as a reader that it was happening, um, but to be to be with a character who is like essentially stuck at work and mm -hmm. close by, but covering for everybody else who like runs out to like, you know, see if their if their loved one is okay, if like you know what's happening, all that. Mm -hmm. That was really that was really it was really surprisingly effective. Maybe not surprisingly, but it was really good. Effective. I'm glad. <laughs> It worked. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I couldn't I couldn't place the golem at the fire. I put, couldn't put Hava there because I was like, she's just going to run in. She would. She's just, or she, try to catch people. I mean, that was one of the things that I thought about is that if she's yeah. there, like there are people following, yeah. she's actually got the physical capacity to catch people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just it, it was that was yeah that was as, as I'm talking about it now I'm remembering oh right that was the other problem was I couldn't I, I I couldn't write it true to her in which she wouldn't like try to do something about it and then it's like then you've got that meddling in history sort of problem. The apartment fire so. felt almost like a proxy to mm -hmm. me that it was like this is this is what she would have been doing if she had been present in the Lower East Side that day. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and obviously, yeah, and obviously you have the problem of like, you know, not, yeah, meddling in history. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's like, once I set these rules for myself, they're like really hard to follow. Like, I mean, of course I'm, I'm, I say, of course, I know there are plenty of, of historical writers who end up meddling quote unquote in history or that, you know, they change things around or they, you know, conveniently eliminate something for for a better narrative but I I I don't know if it's it's I feel I have to give myself as many constrictions as possible in order to write something or what but I'm like I I, I just really want to make it as believable as possible and when it's like in a historical setting that means I should be able to say all this stuff actually happened it's just that no one knows about it and once you've got people in, in, you know, in like the public focus, that's, it's just, you just don't get away with it. So, so you mentioned flashback inception as an issue. Mm -hmm. And that, that raises one of my other questions, which is like your process. Um, how, how did you keep track of so many narratives? Because there are like six separate strands of story. And those are the major stories in the book. Um, how did you, how did you, and, and this is both a question about process and a question about software. Mm, <laughs> yeah. I was like, did you do this in Word? Did you use something like Scrivener? How did you keep track of what was happening where and when? And so, oh, okay. The, 
The answer I always want to say is I kept track of it poorly. And, and that's like, you know, to a certain extent, it's probably the truth just because I was writing and rewriting and I had so many versions and I had so many different ideas of what I wanted to have happen in this book that some storylines actually came about because something else disappeared and I had to replace it with something. Um, but the way, like the functional way I kept track of things was a couple of different pieces of software. Um, one is Scrivener, which for people who don't know is, is like, it's like word on steroids. It's, it's, it allows you to break down a document into sub, multiple sub documents that you can sort of play around with and mix and match and move around. And, and so like all of my chapters, I, the way I write is that I have each chapter is, is a folder. Um, and that's like running down one side of your window. And then each scene um, is its own separate document. So if I have to move something, if I'm like, oh, wait, no, this isn't in chapter seven, this has to happen earlier, I literally can just click and drag and move it somewhere else. And then I have to go through and, you know, is continuity there and blah, blah, blah. But it's not like tedious cutting and pasting. I don't know how people wrote before Scrivener, like Word documents for anything more than two chapters long. I'm like, oh, my God. Um, but... So the other thing that I did was I used um, an app that's called um, Eon Timeline that is not a very well-known app, but is crazy powerful. Um, it lets you um, create an entire timeline that can be as long as you want, as short as you want, um, have any number of different threads or like sort of like levels on which you place events and you can have those uh, by character you can have them by like actual historical event like so I'd have like an arc up at the top of like here's what was happening in the world and then here's what was happening in New York and then here's you know any other number of actual events I needed and then below that was all the characters like when someone was born, when they moved here, when they did da, 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 da. And so you can have everything sort of line up and be like, okay, if I'm looking at stuff that's happening in 1915 and I need to have someone coming from, um, uh, from Syria to the US. And I know that that is during the, um, when the, uh, one of the, what is it called? Um, in the Mediterranean, the blockade, there's like this huge double blockade that was happening that, that was um, keeping like all traffic in the Mediterranean from going anywhere. You basically couldn't leave. It's like, okay, how am I going to have someone come out of there? And so it's on the one hand, I mean, part of that plays to historical accuracy and wanting to get it right. And the other part is like, these are the details that I feel make a book feel lived in. It's like, if if the author, you can tell when the author's done enough research, not just to like get the street names right and to get, you know, historical like events in a row, but also, oh, these were the real life constraints that were being put on people then. And that's going to affect what happens in your actual life. Um, that's, you know, that was what I wanted to get across. And so have being able to just put all of this on essentially what's like a giant scroll and just line everything up and see where it falls and move things around. Um, it's sort of like playing with a gigantic puzzle. Um, and it also, it, it kept me, it kept me from having to remember everything in my head too. That was the other thing. Yeah. This struck me as really something that would be pretty much impossible to keep all in your head. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who could do it. I yeah. tried Scrivener and hated it. But really? <laughs> yeah. It, I just, I just didn't. I couldn't. I couldn't get my head around. It, it, things kept not being where I expected them to be, and it drove mm. me crazy. So I, I switched back to Word. But I don't write like this many. I don't. I don't have this many stories running through a book. So I have. I had it in my head. I don't know if I'll. If I'll, I'll keep it to this, but. I was thinking, you know what? My next book is going to be something I can write in an actual notebook. Like I want to be able to write a book 
<laughs> I want to get a moleskin or a lake term and I want a pen and I want to just write out a book. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's the way my brain works, but it's nice to imagine. Um, to try it. Yeah. It's sort of an interesting yeah. challenge. You, I, oh, I, the, the manuscript challenge. Yeah. You know, theoretically, manuscript means it's handwritten. Oh my God, I never thought of that. I know that's what manuscript actually means. That is actually what it means, manuscript. Yeah. Oh my, okay, mind blown. But like, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I, like I was reading um, an interview with Neil Gaiman where he was talking about writing with his, his trusty fountain pen and his trusty notebook. And I own that particular fountain pen and I own that particular notebook. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> What, what, it's on me. I why why aren't I doing this? So and my hand gets cramped. That's yeah. I type much faster and more comfortably than I write. But yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like typing. Like if it, it's too easy to go back and erase things. It's like writing out. It slows you. It's like it's just a different way to work, and it produces an entirely different things because of that. It's like the the, the process ends up dictating what you get out of it. So. I think maybe uh, that'll be my challenge on the shelf for someday. Yeah. What were the storylines that disappeared? Oh my God. Oh, I could count them on my fingers. Okay, so there was, there's in the first book in The Golem and the Genie, there's a boy named Matthew, who is one of the more minor characters, but seemed to be a reader favorite um he's he's like this very quiet boy in little syria and the book ends uh one of the, the well I, i'm not gonna i don't know about spoilers for the end of the book if i'm talking about the next one but but um in any case he ends up back in syria at the end of of uh the first book um and one of the things i wanted to do was age him up like through the telling of of this 15 year old tale and, and bring him back to the US um, and have him be like he had like two or three different roles he was going to be a member of the pen group with um, Khalil Gibran and Amin Rahani and, and all of the um, in the, you know, the, the uh, Syrian intellectual set that was in the US at the time, um, then I realized that that meant I had to read all of their stuff and understand really what they were you know that there, there was a certain amount of authenticity that i felt i wasn't going to be able to put in that without giving it like a phd dissertation or something um then there was he was going to be uh he was going to run a uh moving picture theater he was going to be like a nickelodeon um and i got so into silent films and i watched so many silent films like a month i spent watching silent films and this was you know 1915 this is like the heyday of um uh what's his ah charlie chaplin and you know all of so many like the, the first movie stars being born in the beginning of of the, the um you know the hollywood um studio system and all of that and i'm like well, this is gonna be a whole book in itself and so i you know went down that rabbit hole for a couple months and then came up out of it and was like oh wait i can't this none of this actually fits like like there's no reason for it there's no compelling reason for this stuff to be in this book except that i want it to be there but it doesn't work so i had to yank all of that out there was um uh, at one point, the, the the baddie that gets defeated in the first book comes came back in the second book, and so I wrote a whole bunch of stuff around that. And as part of that, there was um, uh, an Irish cop in uh, a, just a New York Irish cop who became tangled up in stuff and in, in like these characters in their lives and without really realizing it. And he was, I loved him. He was like a really, really fun character. Um, and cause he had sort of like this hidden secret life and I got to explore all sorts of other stuff with that. Um, and I wrote like all sorts, some of like my favorite stuff that I've written over the last like eight years was his story. And I'm like, oh God, it was just too much. It was way too much plot. I, it, everything was, part of the problem was that I was I couldn't quite figure out 
what to do with Chava and Ahmad. I couldn't figure out what their, what was going to compel them through this book, what their particular struggle was going to be, what was at the heart of it. Um, and I think part of all this futzing around with subplots was to distract myself from the fact that there was a hole in the middle of my book um, that wasn't getting addressed. Um, and <laughs> so, so the, the things that your brain does to sort of either distract or protect and you don't really realize it at the time. Um, but yeah, all of that got taken out. It is all sitting in a folder in my computer um waiting to see what i will do with it perhaps i can still use it perhaps it will be i'll release it as like b-sides and outtakes or something um and you can, you can like i'll put do something like on my website where you can download it for 99 cents or something <laughs> it's like oh look at all the stuff i didn't use <laughs> your patreon you know you start a patreon oh my god i totally should all i didn't even stuff, think of like, that chunk at a time over the course of the next i don't know five years oh I that mean, would be funny i say i feel like you could also like you know re, you could you could recycle some of this into it just a new book i mean yeah like the, the you know because because silent film movie theaters were all over yeah and he could end up in he could simply not have shown up in the um the second book because he wasn't in new york he got sent yeah. off to a different member of the you know former member of the community's brother-in-law or whatever yeah. in in Chicago or Milwaukee or yeah. you know, St. Yeah. Paul or whatever. And Dearborn, Michigan. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> Dearborn, Michigan, for sure, for sure. Yeah. 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 And like, so that's, you know, so so there he is and you know, could but yeah. But, you know, I just no, and the silent film stuff, I mean, I feel like bad that I'm talking about all the stuff that isn't in the book, but so much of it was so interesting because like that was one of the deep in cultural enculturation like americanization of of new immigrants was through yeah. silent film because you didn't need to know english you know every once in a while there'd be a, a card a, a title card with like some dialogue or something written on it but you could basically figure it out from just people's it was it, it became like this lexicon of 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 movements it was like this means you're in love and when you turn out your pocket it means you're broke and you know and so like everyone sort of developed this this language this very visual language that allowed you to participate in the culture without knowing you know without speaking and it was just like it's cool stuff it's like the so language still of want emojis. To use it. Hmm? i said it's like the language of emojis yes yes oh my god <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like uh turn of the century emojis oh my goodness yeah. you're right yeah but yeah no I, i'm i'm thinking about sort of like the the stuff you picked in the the themes of the book and how it intersects because like the movies like the movies movies are associated with magic I mean, in the sense that people talk about the phrase, you know, the phrase movie magic is just part of the cultural lexicon, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not the right kind of magic to intersect with the book. Like, yeah, yeah, really there was, there was all sorts of stuff I was going to write. Oh, well, it'll get out there someday. <laughs> I, I noticed that uh, one of the things that I, when I was thinking about the book is that like the or opening scene of the book has an Orthodox rabbi thinking about how much he hates reformed Jews as they, as they, and they hate him as he like kind of shows up and like goes through this giant pile of books. Uh -huh. And it really kind of, I mean, it really kind of introduced one of what I saw as one of the major themes of the book, which was intra-community conflict mm -hmm. um, and how that intersects with the story of immigration in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of personified by Crindle. Mm -hmm. um was that was that a theme you were sort of thinking about consciously as you worked on it and uh like what yeah sort of the you know the historical events that you know you picked to you know you want to talk about that i don't oh, have sure. a question beyond like this is a cool thing i noticed Helena, but <laughs> and i'll just talk about it because it is a cool thing um yeah that was i mean it's sort of going on from the theme of assimilation which from the beginning was something that I knew I wanted to um, address in this book. 
um, through Haba and Ahmad and through their characters, um, especially Ahmad, that, that he is so, he, he really tries to keep the human world at arm's length. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, he has to conform to a certain amount. And so at what point do you start to, would he start to feel like he is betraying himself or he has become something that he, that he wasn't meant to be? Or, um, you know, would he ever be able to get right with that? Or would he always, always struggle against it? Um, and for Hava, um, she's got sort of the opposite um, incentive because she, her abilities and, and, and you know, the, the thing that she was made for uh, were, are to help people. And so she really, really wants to just fit in and be like everyone. And, but at the same time, there is um, a part, she isn't being true to herself then. There is a big part of her that is not human at all. Um, so, and that felt to me like, okay, that was one of the reasons why I wanted the book to take so long was because, you know, if you're looking at the process of assimilation, that's got to play out over a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, and also looking at what was happening in the respective immigrant communities at the time um, and how, you know, you could tell when someone was fresh off the boat. And you could tell when someone had been around for a little while and had gotten a little American. And then, you know, and then in the um, uh, in the Syrian community, I didn't get to talk about this as much as I wanted to, um, but there was more um, back and forthing, like going back home and then, uh, you know, coming back to America with another member of your family or just going home to do, you know, bring money home and to see your family and then coming back. That happened more um, in the Syrian community because um, the Lebanese, uh, you know, this is the, the Lebanese Syrians, at least in like the 1910s, weren't escaping persecution in the same way that like the European Jews were. And so like, you didn't get a lot of Europe, you know, when, when the European Jews came over, they were here to stay and they were trying to bring more people over, but with, it was more of a back and forth with, with, uh, with the Lebanese. And you would see like you reading these memoirs of like, well, I got home and now I'm too American for my family and I come back and I'm not American enough for, for the Syrians. And it's, you, and so there's like this whole feeling of in-betweenness and you know some of some of that isn't I mean there's a lot of stuff in in with between like orthodox and reform Judaism that isn't specific to America in the least it's just the history of of um you know there's there is a distinctly European reform Jewish history it started in Germany and and so on um, but the, it's the, it, it all stems from that same impetus of like, how do we figure out where the line is for ourselves of how to be true to our roots and our heritage and our religion, and at the same time, not divide ourselves off from the people around us. Um, that, you know, was just a a constant, it, it's a it's constant struggle. It's not just then, it's now, it's all, you know, all through human history. So yeah, so that was, I, I put all of that stuff in there deliberately. And I, I tried to not, I mean, I try not to pound people over the head with anything. Mm -hmm. um, I try to just set up the dichotomies and set up the, you know, the whole spectrum and just watch, you know, sit, characters on different you know places in it and just watch it play out the back and forth aspect is interesting because yeah that's something where like I you know I come from a I come from a Jewish background and like my relatives came and pretty much didn't go back um but like I know that's not true for all my friends um I have, I have plenty of friends where like they're the, the thing that really weirds me out is is people who's whose ancestors immigrated generations ago and they're literally still in touch with their cousins yeah. in the old country. Is that like, I mean, like that's really rare among 
Jewish Americans unless you're, you know, they like they made it out, right? So yeah, there's um, but yeah, that I I'll say I did definitely. I, when, when you said that, I immediately thought of um, Arbeely's trip because mm -hmm. you, know, you do show us some of that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you're you're uh, like when you're talking about assimilation, I was thinking about the centrality of language in the book um, because you have like Chava and Ahmad and how much they love like learning new human expressions and sharing them with each other, but also Toby getting Ahmad's attention by yelling at him in Giddish <laughs> um, and Ahmad's grief about never being able to speak um, the Jinn language again. Mm -hmm. and, and Crandall's stubbornness about Hebrew and like this all sort of wove together and like the that sort of and that I hadn't thought about how much that intertwines with the sort of the story of immigration and assimilation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that it, so much of it becomes about language and, and keeping your language and whether you're passing that language on to your kids or whether you know how how quickly do you learn English? How do you um you know and that and that determines who you talk to and and you know maybe you end up picking it up maybe you end up uh you know taking classes i know that like my grandparents took classes when they came over and you know learned as quickly as they could um but also yeah i mean so that thing with with ahmad and his um inability to speak his own language because he's he's now locked in human form and even if he could speak it there isn't anyone to speak it to uh mm -hmm. for him he that became when i realized that that this was like i i needed i needed a key into like why ahmad was going to be like what he wasn't going to be able to share with Hava and what he wasn't going to be able to um so what was going to just eat at him and eat at him and that became it and there's a scene uh toward the beginning of the book there's a uh scene that takes place in central park um uh, where he decides to go ice skating and he sort of at one point uh forgets himself while he's ice skating and, and hava is standing on the she's standing on the bank yelling at him because she's terrified that that he's going to fall through the ice and he yells back at her um and uses what is a, a jinn idiom um and then just berates himself for it because he it's like a part of himself that he didn't necessarily want to show her and that he can't feels like he can't share with her because it isn't something she'll understand and it's like that's the beginning in some ways of the rift that forms between them is is over language and is over um that she can't you know he doesn't want her to have access to who he used to be um because it's just not who he is anymore and so he's you know he's trying to live with that and he ends up pushing her away because of it um and and you know i see this with you know, people who have relatives or, or parents or grandparents who came over um, from somewhere else. And it's like, who are they in their language? And who is that person? Who is that a different person than who I know? Um, you know, just on, on a personal note, I hear my father-in-law speaking in Arabic on the phone with his family back home. And it's got a very different cadence to it than when he speaks in English um they're different you, you just hear the pattern I, I don't speak a word of arabic but you can just hear the pattern of conversation is very different than how he speaks in Eng in his second language a learned language and it's like who is he in arabic i don't know i don't know that particular iteration of the guy i've known since i was 18 years old you know mm -hmm. so so taking that like to another level, the way that Hav and Ahmad do, where it's like, okay, it's not just different he, languages, it's human language versus a different language, another type of language entirely. Um, it's just another way to like externalize all of these issues and, and make them and sort of blow them up and, and, you know, make them not quite about us, but still entirely about us. 
So you mentioned uh, the scene, one of the scene, one of the scenes in Central Park, and that reminded me I was going to ask you. Um, both of your books have like are set in New York City and have like a really strong sense of place. Um, and uh, I know you lived in New York for a while. Um, can you talk a little bit about just sort of how you decided, like you know how you how you made the city real in your writing and like the sort of the the how you figured out like, you know, what things were there at the time and what mm -hmm. things weren't, um, the research and the, just. The, the, the so I lived in New York for two years. That was, that was it. Um, they were very uh, busy two years because I was in grad school. Um, but it, that, I mean, it was a good introduction to the city, but I, I so in some ways I feel like I didn't really start learning New York until I left and got deep into writing these books. Um, and I did want to make it, uh, I did want to make, I think from the outset, I wanted to make the city as much of a character as I could um, because so much of, especially in, in the first book, when Hav and Ahma get to New York, and it's such a process of discovery for them. Um, and it's like, what, where, what is this place that I have landed in? What are these things? What, you know, just, I wanted to be able to see the city through their eyes. And that meant knowing what I was looking at. So I spent an awful lot of time um, in photo archives um, online. Um, the New York Public Library Digital Archive um, has, I don't know how many thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of photos of the city. Um, and you can, if you're uh, determined enough, basically find any street corner in any number of years and just sort of shuffle through the photos and see how the city is changing in any particular spot. Um, there's a uh god i can't remember the name of the the, the outfit but there's um um what were called real estate maps that i don't know if they still make these um that were um city block by city block um with a map of the buildings on that block and that showed their size their positioning um the number of floors whether they had a storefront on the first floor um, and if it was like a tenement, if the tenements had a yard that was like connecting them and it was, like, they were just insanely detailed. So I like downloaded all of these and I stitched them together and I made uh, for, I think it was like the 1912 or 16, I don't remember, um, real estate map, but I made like, like a PDF of it that if I printed it out would probably like take up an entire wall. Um, that I could just zoom in and see what were the buildings, what were the streets, what was, um, and, and you could sort of catch the character of a neighborhood from these maps. It was like, okay, so was it mostly warehouses? Is it mostly residential? You know, there were some places where, you know, especially like toward the north of Manhattan, where it was still like stables and a few places where it's like houses with yards that, you know, aren't there anymore, but you know, as as like you're getting towards the edge of of the city and um, and where the mansions were and all of that. So I had to piece that all together. And then as I'm telling the story, like if if some because there's so much walking in these books, <laughs> characters walk a lot. And sometimes I had to, you know, they're they're especially early on, I would send my, my agent these, these chapter drafts and he'd write back and say, okay, you're not giving us a walking tour of lower Manhattan. This is in fact a novel, you know, this is, you're not Rick Steves, <laughs> you know. Put that on your Patreon as well, the walking tour. The walking <laughs> tour of, of, of the Golem yeah. and the Genie. Oh, see, but the problem, yeah, well, then, then you get to see all the things that I sort of flexed and, oh, and no, you know, it's like, okay, could you really get from here to there in two hours? I don't know. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, let's just draw a veil over that. Um, but the, so yeah, so I, between the photos and the maps and just sort of figuring out what the telling detail would be 
you know, okay, what would a character notice if they're in a particular mood and they're walking through this neighborhood? What's going to piss them off? What is going to make them feel depressed? What is going to make them feel happy about being where they are? What are you, what are they going to notice? Um, that, uh, you know, ended up informing what I picked and chose um, and sort of helped tie the city to the characters, I think. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left. So if we want to open to questions, we could do that. Yeah, um, audience, please type any questions that you have in the chat and Davith and I will pose them for you. Um, and I actually have a question to kick things off um, with, with the audience questions. Um, you know, I think a lot in working in a bookstore about genre because, you know, we have a separate section for science fiction and fantasy and literary fiction and everything sort of has its little home within the store. And you really write across genres. Um, do you feel like there's one place or the other where you're, where these books would be more at home? Um, I don't know. I used to say no. I mean, okay, so uh, it used to be that I would go into a bookstore and it was like a 50-50 chance whether they were in sci-fi and fantasy or um, or literary fiction. Um, and I love that. I, like, I love that there's no one good place to shelve my books. I think, I mean, I'm sure it's a pain in the butt for, you know, marketers and, and people who actually <laughs> want, want to be able to put a book in this place in the bookstore, but there isn't room for it. And, you know, so, but it's, I think, I think it's fun to, because it does, I, I think, it, not, not, I, I think it there's a possibility of reaching more readers because there's just different things for different people in these books. There's like, some people are just New York history buffs and some people are folklore buffs and some people, um, you know, like the, like the general historical or, or, or the, the, the Judaism or, you know, all of that. And so I, I, I feel lucky that I get to draw from a bunch of diverse um, audiences. One thing that is starting to happen, I think, just in seeing how the Hidden Palace um, has been uh, like either well reviewed or just sort of presented or talked about is people are starting to classify it more as fantasy sci-fi than they used to. And I think that's actually pretty cool because I think, uh, what was going on, some of what was going on before was, I think some people were like, well, I like it, so it can't be fantasy sci-fi, you know? There's that, I, I, I remember talking, it, it used to be that, that it was a bit more of like looked down upon um, to put something in fan. Well, it doesn't, doesn't have a, a dragon or, or a robot on the cover. So it clearly can't be one of those two. And it was just sort of a narrow mindedness about the genre. Um, and I think over the last you know decade or more, there's been more, there's been such an, there's been expansion of that. And so much more of our, our culture, like our cultural touchstones are sort of originating in fantasy sci-fi that I think it's sort of blown the genre open to a wider audience and that it's becoming more inclusive in any number of ways. And so I think that's sort of cool. And I'm, I'm basically, I'm happy with wherever it gets put. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I have a little mental list of fantasy novels for people who think they don't like fantasy. And, and your work is definitely on, on that mental list. Oh, cool. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a great question from Bob um, asking, was the idea of a romantic relationship between Chava and Ahmad there from the beginning or did that develop in the writing? Um, it was there from the beginning, um, but I wanted to do it in a way that felt true to the characters. It felt to me like they weren't just going to fall into bed with each other. I mean, and that's all well and good. I love books where people just, you know, where it's like the, 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 the eyes lock across the room and then, you know, goes from there. But that wasn't 
who these two were. And, and I don't think I understood at the beginning quite how much they were going to argue before they, you know, made any sort of, um, uh, you know, more lasting and deeper connection to each other. But yeah, they had to go through a lot of arguments before they could like actually get to feel like they knew each other. Um, and I think that was part of just how I designed the characters was that, you know, here is this crazy experience they are sharing, but they come at it through completely different lenses. Um, and that was going to have to um, inform their conversations with each other before they could um, get to anything that felt even close to a romantic relationship. So yeah, I, I do feel like they earned it, right? Like they, when, when I, I wanted it to feel like they, they earned that, they earned, they earned their places with each other. I've got a question for you now. Um, Helene, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your original inspiration for having a, a golem and a genie at the beginning? Right. So, oh gosh, this was back at Columbia. This is when I was in grad school. Um, and I was, so one thing that happens when you get to a master's of fine arts program is, for, for creative writing at least, is that you, um, you know going in that you're going it, to, it's, it's like any other master's program that you need a thesis, but for this program, it's going to be a body of creative work. Um, and it's thought that this is going to be the thing that you're going to take out with you when you leave and it's you know it's either going to be like part of a novel or a collection of short stories and that's going to be you know hopefully the first thing that you you know pitch and sell or whatever um and so I when I got there I knew what I wanted to write was um a, a linked, linked short story collection that was tales from my family history and my husband's family history. Um, because, you know, I am Jewish, he's Arab Ameri American, and our family stories, you know, from two cultures that are supposed to be like this, around the issue of coming to America, our family story were so similar. Um, just like the resonances of, you know, immigration and, um, and assimilation and, the, and then being like, being raised the kid of an immigrant and feeling always like you've got that shadow behind you of a different place, a place you've never seen. Um, and maybe, you know, they're there and just that you're like a few degrees off from the rest of culture. Um, and so I wanted, so I started writing these stories um, and they were very realist, very, you know, Raymond Carver-esque sort of um, stories. And they weren't going very well. They were, they were okay. They weren't blowing the doors off anything, you know, that's for sure. And, you know, one or two of them eventually made it into print, but the rest of them, it was like, like, I just wasn't getting where I wanted to be with them. And, you know, the, I was getting pretty lukewarm, you know, comments back on it from, from my, my workshop mates. And I was complaining about this to a, um, one of the people in my workshop that, you know, I wanted to be writing better than I was writing. And she said, you need to stop doing this you need to, to, you know, she's like, I, I know you, I've been to your apartment, I've seen your books, you're a nerd, you're a complete and total nerd, and you are, for some reason, writing all of this realist stuff when that's not where your heart is, and you need to be doing something fantastical, and, you know, I'm like, what you know it just it wasn't like I'd self-censored myself or anything just for some reason it just hadn't occurred to me I was being a big dumb idiot about it um and she I said well, okay but what what about these stories and she said okay you can work on you know your family stories but make it fantastical that's the next thing I want to see from you in class and so I went home and, you know, to my little apartment and I sat there and thought about it. And I was like, okay, so what if instead of the, the Jewish girl and Arab American boy that I'd had sort of wandering through these, these short stories, 
what if we turn it into a girl golem and a boy genie thinking it was like those were the most um uh you know emblematic creatures of each you know folklore creatures from each culture and it was like as soon as I thought of that and I could picture these two and I could like externalize it then it was like we were off to the races I had literally that night like the first 12 pages of what would become the golem and the genie and that and I thought I still thought it was a short story until I brought it into a uh, class and handed it around and they got back to me and said well this is better than everything else you've given us so thank you you know you're you're on a good track here um but it's not a short story this is a this is a big novel this is you you know whatever you've got that's here it's it's bigger than a short story and so that really was the beginning of it and i sort of picked 1899 manhattan out of thin air and now it, it was like i had backed myself into the biggest research project of my life like figuring out who these people were, what was going on in 1899 Manhattan, how do people even live, just getting a baseline for the whole thing. Um, and then having to research all the individual subjects and, and the city and et cetera. And so it was, I mean, it was a gigantic project. It was the sort of thing where it's like, it's a good thing I didn't know going in, you know, because then you just, I would have psyched myself out of it completely, sort of like parenthood that way. It's like when <laughs> you, you sort of, you don't, you think it's going to be a lot of work, but you don't know it in your bones until you've done it. So it, yeah, that was, that was whole, how the whole thing started. And it's, I mean, that was 15 years ago. I've been working been with these characters for that long. And it's just sort of astonishing to me. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing it. Um, we are just about out of time, but we do have one last question from Bob, which I'd like to get in before we uh, run out of time, um, asking, were there literary golems or genies that informed or inspired your work? As you yes, and I should have said it off at the very beginning, um, a golem written by one Naomi Kritzer um, in a short story that she wrote. Um, in Is that collected in, um, in oh God. Yes. Cat pictures, please, and other stories. Oh, wait, that's in cat pictures. It's not in uh, Call My Grandmother. Oh, you know what? It's it's also it's I don't remember. Okay, so I had two self-published collections, and I don't remember which one of those it's in. Okay. Um, the, the small press um, collection, it's in that. Okay. Called cat pictures, so, please, and other stories. And and so that was the first girl golem, female golem, I had ever seen um, in in literature. Um, and so I, I knew it could be done. It, I knew that I wasn't like absolutely the first person ever to try doing this or anything. And I also knew about Cynthia Ozick, the Putter Messer papers, which I did not read until literally two months ago um, because I, I wanted, it became sort of the thing where it was, where it was like, I, another like psyching yourself out. Like why, why would I read Cynthia Ozick on goal, on female golems and then feel like I could write anything ever again. Like, you know, the, the, it's it's Cynthia Ozick, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> why do that to yourself? Um, but then I did finally, and oh, it's so good, it's so good. Um, as for Jin, there's, you know, the funny thing, all the, all the examples I'm thinking of off the top of my head are more recent than my first book. Um, there's All If the Unseen uh, by G. Willow Wilson, uh, and that's a fantastic book um, that features a, a, a really, really cool genie. Um, and there's so much of American culture about gin, gin, so much about that you get in America about gin is like so Disney-fied and so I Dream of Genie and all of that. I think like the stuff that I was using sort of as a baseline was like the original tales was like the original Thousand and One Nights, which also, I mean, has its own history of being like a very weird mishmash of, of East and West and, um, and all of that. But yeah, I went back like to the original folk tales 
and you know the 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 superstitions and I mean that still lasts till today there's there's you know jinn are still a big part of of um, Arab and Muslim, you know, culture and just sort of a fact of life. Um, you know, when you, you move to a new place, you set out offerings for the jinn so that they leave you alone. You know, it's that and, you know, exorcisms still happen and and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, it was like a matter of just sort of researching and then having to pick and choose and decide what my version was going to be. Thank you so much, Helene and, and Naomi. I'm afraid we're out of time tonight, but it has been a fascinating and a really enjoyable evening. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Naomi. Thank you for inviting me. This was really fun. Yes, yes. thank you both. Thank you, audience. Um, and you can order both of their wonderful books at northshire.com. Please night, support everybody. your local indie bookstores. Thank you. Take good care. You too.